The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, we've been chatting up here and taking up your valuable time. We have the uh, privilege today to have Don Lassard, Professor Don Lassard, speaking. Uh, Don and I and Professor Sylvie taught this course the, the previous prior two years. So he's, he's been in here before. He's an expert on international business, international finance, regular finance, and of course the Cuban Revolution, which he witnessed as a small boy. Don. <laughs> Perfect start. Okay. Uh, I, I, I wish I'd been with you all term, but I'm glad I'm not. I'm on sabbatical this year and I'm enjoying that, so I'm uh, probably a bit rusty in the classroom today, but I hope, hope we'll have a good time. I'm going to talk about innovation and energy business models. So that's a big mouthful because we're trying to get a lot of things done in one session. Uh, but it's where I really want to go is to make you, you know, comfortable with, focus on these, these are the big questions. The first question always is, what problem are we solving? What's the value proposition? What problem are we solving? For whom? How? How will we monetize it? How will we turn it into a business? What's the best business model to do that? Second question, and we're not going to answer all of that, but I want to give you a little sense of which kinds of energy in innovations lend themselves to startups which kinds of energy in innovations have to be undertaken by large incumbent firms, which ones might be undertaken by new big pioneering firms, which ones require consortia, right? So how big, what kind of structure has to carry a particular type of innovation forward? Because energy is a very complicated space. Um, then this is something we will not completely deal with in the session, but I'll start on. And you've been talking about a lot already. Un under what circumstances will the innovation you're focusing on be viable? And who and what has to change for it to work? Because that's the primary question. You've got a better light bulb. Who is going to have to change for it to work? What are the various barriers to change going to be? Uh, you looked at Hexion. You looked at biofuels. You've got questions within the firm. You have questions with the customer. You have questions within the industry. You have questions with regulation. You have questions with societal attitudes. So which of those things have to change? And that takes you back to the business model because the business model very often will be not only about producing the thing but also bringing about the change that's required so that the thing will be viable in the marketplace. Right. So that, that may really complicate the notion of a business model. Uh, and you know, finally, the kind of the standard strategy questions, what capabilities, what do you have to be good at, what scale, what scope, what various activities do you have to be involved in, and where do you have to be? And that's for another session later. Where do you have to be to make this work? And of course, the answer is, it all depends. <laughs> uh, I'd say it depends, it depends on many things, but I'm going to focus on really the first two. So, and they're, they're related. They're slightly different concepts, but they're related. It depends upon the maturity of the technology, and it depends upon whether the innovation is disruptive or not. So we need to start doing some classification of the nature of the technology, the nature of the innovation, to understand what kind of business models might work. OK? So far. Uh, and then. I'm going to talk a bit about innovation games, which is a nice way to think about different types of innovation processes. It's some new work being done by a friend of mine, and then we'll end with some innovation business models. Okay, so technology maturity. Uh, you uh, read, read the paper. Here we have, you know, you can do this with a rising S curve, or you can do this with this falling curve in terms of rate of innovation. Uh, but there's a sense that most technologies go through these three phases, right? There's a phase of a fluid phase. Uh, what's the statement in Genesis? Was without form and void? <laughs> so without form and void, and there may be some sense of an unmet need, and there are lots of different solutions being brought about. Uh, nobody's quite sure how to do it. 
their entrance from all kinds of places. It's a zoo. It's highly fluid. Uh, there is no clear sense about which the best products or technologies or even what categories sometimes the products or services fit into. Warren Buffett talked, I think, about 2,000 automobile manufacturers circa 1910. Yeah. Everybody with a different way to get rich. So automobiles took off, yeah, 2,000 automobile manu manufacturers in the U.S. by what, 1933, you'd probably slim down to 16. Now we're back to what, eight maybe, but with three based in the U.S., big consolidation over time. Uh, fluid phase, everybody's at it. Uh, transitional phase, you know, it's, it's starting to take shape. And then the mature phase, it's consolidated. Uh, and it's really blocking and tackling and tough competition on an operational basis, and it's largely scale-based. It's Comcast, right? <laughs> so you think about uh, communications and internet and all those things. We've got some mature monopolists over here with regulatory capture, and that, that's mature phase. But we've got all kinds of new stuff going on in the same time and a number of transitional things going on at the same time. And energy is particularly lively this way. Uh, again, from the paper fluid phase, right, a lot, of, a lot of uncertainty. This is important. A high rate of product innovation and high degree of process flexibility means people do things lots of different ways. It's almost craft industry. One company does it one way, another company does it another way. You really haven't scaled it. Uh, you produce the product or service however you can. Demand is taking off but still it's low total volume. This is important, not always the case, but right, what, what does that tell you about who's buying the product in this phase? Functionality is more important than brand names. Who's buying the product? Who would care more about functionality than brand name? Think about it in terms of computers or internet. Somebody who really knows the stuff, right? Somebody who knows the functionality, is a, is a lead user, is really into what it does. Don't tell me who makes it. Tell me exactly what it does, right? So you get the techies of that particular product into it. So the early emergence of an electrical car uh, or the early emergence of, of some other new product may be much more about the intricacies of that particular product because you've got a set of people who are fascinated with the functionality, right? Later, it becomes, is it accepted? Is it a brand name? Is it kind of standard? So this is saying that the markets are different, the nature of what's going on in the firm is, as we go across, but also the customer behavior is different. And what are you trying to do? You're trying to develop your technology, and you're trying to hang on to it because you're inventing new ways to satisfy some unmet need you're going to try to cash in on that. You know that there's going to be a shakeout. You know there's going to be a consolidation. You're trying to hang on either to a market position or some IP or ideally both, right? Now we get into transitional phase, dominant design. So think about bicycles in what, 1880s? And they had big, one big front wheel and they had a little small wheel and they had two equal wheels and some had chains and some didn't. If you look in the old books, all kinds of designs. I don't know what year, but probably mid-90s or maybe 2005, 1905 or so. The standard two-wheel bicycle with a seat position, the chain emerged as the dominant design. Of course, there were other companies making other designs, but most bicycle companies were focused on that. What happens? There's a much better understanding about what's, what customers need, much more process innovation. So uh, in my global strategy class, one of my favorite cases to teach is Shimano. We look at Shimano from 1921 through the present. And Shimano starts off in a small village outside of Osaka. It actually is the village where the samurai swords were made. So it has, it has experience with metalworking. The bicycle's not invented there, it's invented in France. 2,000 bicycle shops spring up in a year. Everybody's making bicycles in their own shops. But as the dominant design emerges and as you get 2,000 bicycle shops, Shimano figures out that there are economies of scale in making rear hubs and crank sets. 
not in welding frames, not in putting on handlebars, not in making bicycle seats, but in making hubs and crank sets. And then they get really good at that. They become codependent, right? They become a supplier of components to the whole industry. You still have a couple thousand bicycle makers, but you have one company that's making the high scale economy, more high technology product. And they really start focusing on process innovation. They find ways to make things cheaper with the same quality. So they go from uh, casting to drop forging. A huge jump in quality. So process technology starts becoming the differentiator because it allows me to develop, deliver the same product, right? either at a lower cost or with greater functionality. So back to the frontier you were talking about last, last period. And so the competition becomes much more about process and that's scale and experience and becoming good at things, right? And quanti quality and availability becomes the competition. The technological capabilities of the firm are much less about development, much more about manufacturability. Uh, again, we've got a large customer base. We probably have a fairly strong brand. Mature phase, right? The product starts commoditizing. There are more than enough manufacturers for it. There's a more than enough capacity for it. It's very hard to differentiate your product from someone else's. More similarities than differences in final products. Convergence of project and process innovation. Really focused on cost control. Lean and efficient organization. Lean, tight, not waste a penny. Do everything right. Now, just think about the company that is in the mature phase, how ready it is now to engage in a new round of innovation. It's just squeezed all of that out. Right? If it's a single product company, it's in a phase of its life where it's really worried about efficiency and production process. And it's pretty well forgotten. It's forgotten about the innovation process. A classic example was uh, Volkswagen, which was a single product company for many years. And the bug became, the, the Beetle became the dominant design. And it was out there and it held up and it held up and it held up and they kept producing and producing and producing it, staying in that market. They forgot how to design a car. They forgot how to bring in a new model. It took them a lot of time to relearn that. Right? So you see this kind of cycle. This, this is common sense stuff, but it's you look at a technology, it's important to think about where are you in the evolutionary period? Is this kind of pre-fluid, pre right? You don't even know what's going on. Is this fluid, but it's starting to take shape? Uh, is this transitional where you're beginning to see the emergence of dominant designs and you're starting to see the shakeout and you're starting to see a few firms take on strong positions? Or is this really mature, cost-based, quality-based, brand-based competition where the big players win, typically, or the very focused players win? Uh, and, okay, so, you've got it. Uh, spend two or three minutes, five minutes, three minutes with the three or four people around you. What I want is an example of an energy technology at each stage of evolution. So again, something that is just emerging, turmoil, something that's kind of in a transitional stage where you can start seeing that it's gonna look this way but it's not quite settled, and something where it's highly mature, it's head-to-head -head competition, uh, so think about clean tech products of a wide variety and again, very importantly, I'd say any, anywhere, right, anywhere in the, in the energy supply chain. So I, I tend to think of, right, primary energy, uh, conversion, transmission, distribution, uh, end use, but now we have end use in industry residential, transport, and then I guess we have Dick's area, which is how do we, how do we balance that stuff? <laughs> or how do we balance the whole thing if we include demand management, right? So that would be the space we're looking at. So anything in that space, uh, new technologies, innovative technologies for, new is the wrong word, but 
technologies that are coming into the marketplace or are in the marketplace for primary energy, energy conversion, energy transmission, storage, et cetera, or for all kinds of end use, what stage would you put them at? And kind of within your group, give me, give me one for each area. Give me fluid transitional mature. So we have not not only do we we have batteries and very different kinds of battery technologies and we have compressed air and we have flywheels and we actually have quite a few substitutes because we have fast start generators right and demand management is actually a substitute if you think of the balance but it's a zoo, right? I've been trying to follow A123 with its grid level storage and no one knows what the dominant design is there. And is this to be used for grid stabilization? Do you want to stick it out on the end next to a wind farm, right? It's not known. It's all going on over in Department of Material Science. There are what about six different, six or seven different competing companies or more out of DMSE. Right. I like Sadaway swimming pools. Okay. Uh, a transitional? Uh, for transitional, I would propose to wind. Because Which kind of wind? Okay, okay let's, let's put wind. Good. <laughs> Why is it transitional? Drive by. Pardon? Well, like, they want to be drive by. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, so, so grid, grid level wind. Uh, and I, again, if we were drilling down a little bit, we'd find, I think, that on onshore wind looks like it's starting to standardize. Offshore wind is still very much in the air in terms of the standard design, right? So you're you're somewhere in between. Uh, although there's, I guess there's still some big transitions in the size of the blades. I look out my window in Vermont and I have 180 footers now, and they're going to build 480 footers, right? So with the strobe lights. Is beginning to right, but that's that's the point. So it's it's you know the water's starting to freeze. It's starting to congeal. It's starting to standardize. Uh, there's a real shift. Partly the demand is has shrunk a little bit with European uh, financial difficulties, with uncertainties about the U.S. credits, and the Chinese have run through a very quick ramp up. Partly, but it's also starting to consolidate. Right, so it's okay. Tra mature or, or mature? Big. Oh, that's a very interesting question. Do you think today's boiling water reactors will be the design used in 20 years? No. Right. So that's right. That's your question mark. So it's it's mature and almost dead now. But if it comes back to life, it's probably going to become fluid for a little while. I hope not too fluid. But anyway, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, team in the middle. Whoever you are. So for fluid, we have we'll say fuel cells. Which? Fuel cells. Fuel cells. Yeah. Uh, that may that's yeah, it's pretty fluid. Maybe free, but that's good. It's right. It's still largely in the labs. We gotta find something that doesn't need platinum. Uh, transitional? Uh, solar. Grid solar. That again, we start drilling down, right? So the crystalline stuff looks fairly mature. The thin film stuff is probably fluid. Uh, the concentrated solar is still probably fluid. So uh, that's so that's a good catch-all. So let's just say grid. What's nice about it is while you have a pretty mature crystalline silicon technology in solar, you've got all these other designs being worked on, uh, Solyndra, et cetera, and people looking to increase efficiency, and if somebody hits it, right. it get, uh, crystalline silicon gets displaced. Well, and you have everybody looking at the efficiency of, of the chip, and all that matters is the installation cost, so. <laughs> Chip more efficient, you don't have to have as much installation because you don't take as much it's still, space. Still, still. Still. When we get it, okay, I'll take a group over here. I, I don't know exactly where the boundaries of the groups are, but I'll just take one. In the back on this side. Uh, we want 
a mature one or uh, this we well, you say the same, we just say the same. So okay, so for, for fluid, we talked about like wave energy when in the ocean, ocean wave okay. energy. Okay, and that may be pre also, but it's starting. It's starting to merge. So ocean or a or wave. It's very early. So for the transition, we actually talked about wind and solar. So yep. Kind yep. Of okay. And mature, we talked about like turbines, like uh, gas turbine or yes, like. Uh, Coal, coal fired plants, stuff like that. Why, why is it with why is it that you're all focused here? If we're going to solve right, if we're going to solve the energy problem, we got to knock a third off the carbon footprint here. We've got to cut a third of the inefficiency here, and we've got to cut use here by a third. Why is it you're only focusing on one of the three? Okay, let's have something over here. <laughs> For fluid technology, most of ours have been discussed when we talked about y tricity and transitional... Well, again, fl fluid was? y tricity It's a company. Okay, what do they do? They develop the technology. It's this professor who developed the technology that basically wirelessly transmits electricity. Ah. Okay, so, so wireless... Yeah, yeah. Tesla comes back to life, right? <laughs> okay, good. Transitional. We talked about LEDs and solid-state batteries, um, and we wanted to separate batteries into several categories and argue that uh, lead-acid, lithium-ion, and nickel-cadmium are more mature already. <coughs> right. So, so again, uh, which kind of batteries do I have here? Uh, solid-state batteries. Solid batteries, and here I have lead-acid batteries. Right. So, this is interest and now you're moving into the middle and at least towards the end with those two <laughs> uh, but but it's interesting because the categories right you say within within an existing broad category of technology you probably have some of all of those right within wind within solar within storage within lighting so you've got these life cycles going on within classes of technology as well as across. Uh, anybody, okay, let's go over here. Anything radically different? No? Nope. Okay. Anybody who's got some downstream examples, you know, something here like what we use? Uh, yeah. Pardon? Okay. Uh, tell me a little bit more. For what kind of use? Okay, so take a look at your wall wart, whatever is in there. Uh, oftentimes, like old ones generally have transformers inside, and then they rectify it. But newer ones, which are more efficient, tend to have uh, a type of electrical uh, converter. Uh, so power supplies and power converters for all kinds of stuff. Okay. Uh, some of them, right, I mean, there's, there clearly is a, there's a mature category of those, right? And then, so, uh, power converters, but there's also, right, emerging, emerging better ways of doing this. Uh, yeah, I spent about a day running around Delta Electronics in Taiwan, and they're all over this. They are, right, the power converter guys. Yeah. Um, Mature could be a fluorescent light. What? Fluorescent. Oh, fluorescent light, yeah. Yeah. So now we have fluorescent, right? It's not dead yet. Uh, it still has several waves of innovation in it. It's still competitive for some uses, but it's mature technology. Although, I guess the drivers, the drivers for the fluorescent light, there's some big changes putting the drivers on a chip. Lowers the cost, raises the efficiency. So if you get inside the fluorescent light, there, there's some MIT professors who have the new chips to drive them. Yeah. Um, there's a different way of approaching this, where you wanted us to discuss the, the final third as well. So I'll put habits in mature, because I don't see much innovation in thinking about how you can do energy. That is, that is a very interesting different way. So you'd say, you know, what, what is it? And we'll, we'll come, when we talk about disruption, we'll talk about the customer. It was a nice thing saying, here we're talking about hard stuff, technology. But in fact, human behavior 
human behavior could be categorized and institutional behavior could be categorized in the same way. And uh, our habits for commuting and driving and where we choose to live, those things are pretty hardwired. Our habits regarding the use of electricity, mental attitudes, probably pretty mature. We've been doing that now for uh, 100, 130 years. Right. Pretty mature habit. <laughs> Uh, we've got some things that are transitional. There may be some things that are quite fluid, right? So this is, so you could apply a similar thinking structure to behaviors. Uh, this is focused on technology. But I think you've all got the point on anytime you're looking at a technology, you want to know where it's at uh, because that's going to tell you a lot about the business, what's going to be required to have a successful business model in that phase. Okay, now we'll go on to the next piece of this, which is discontinuities are disruptive, and they're similar, and Hiram, maybe you can straighten me out in terms of the difference between these literatures. I view them as almost the same. But the, the point of kind of discontinuities or disruptive change, so we've got some incumbent technology, right, and it's gone through an S-curve of unit sales, and it's matured, and it's leveling off, and a challenger comes in. Out of the fluid phase, it starts really emerging, let's say in the transitional phase in here, it starts garnering some sales. It's probably not direct competition at first. It may even be dismissed as irrelevant, right? Uh, and over time, if it's, if it's appropriate, right, it will supplant the existing technology. So I gave you a reading about Kodak uh, and a reading about some of the difficulties that Kodak had in dealing with, right? This is film-based photography. Kodak wrote it from the initial chemistry to pretty much dominating the market, although they did have a little challenge from the Japanese and the Germans, but they rode that market very nicely. Now we're in a totally different world. Nobody uses film. Totally different product. And so you see these cycles over and over again. Uh, I may be getting out of, out of line a little bit, but, but one of the things you want to think about in these discontinuities is who who is having to change? This becomes a critical thing. So the question I'll pose in two slides after I do this next one is discontinuous at what level? Disruptive at what level? Because you really have to sort that out. But in order for your opportunity to materialize, what changes do you need? Do you need changes in end user behavior, habits? Do you need changes in prices? Do I now need peak load pricing? Or do, do I need carbon pricing? <laughs> Do I need a change in policies, building codes, right? So a whole series of things that may need to change, not just my technology. My technology may be maturing, but I, need, I may need behavior, I may need prices, I may need regulation. And of course, we'll come back to these, but you'll think about right, which, which points you can lever. Let's look at this, this point now, though. Disruptive to what? So we, we're trying to classify a technology an innovation as to whether it will be disruptive or not, not just because it's fun, but because it gives us some notion of how we need to address it and what it will take to get it implemented. Is it disruptive to the customer, to the firm, to the incumbent firm, to the platform or system, to the industry, to the regulatory context, to the social acceptance and mindset, right? We're kind of going down in levels of difficulty. So, oh, that slide turned out beautifully. Uh, but customer, and we could, you've talked a bit about customers taking on new products. You know, we, 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 tend, we tend to focus on the price and the economics of a new energy use. And then, of course, we get in an argument about whether people really look at the current cost or whether they look at the life cycle cost. Uh, but there are two other issues, at least, that go along with that price and that price calculation. New behaviors or competencies. Do I have to start acting in a different way? Does this require that I undo some habits to use this new product? If it does, I've got a much harder sell, right? And I, I have to think, this is not marketing my product. This is getting you to change your behavior. That's one issue. Or the other, of course, is does it require new system complements? Do I have to have other goodies to go along with it? Uh, so you give me some device for um, 
I don't know, controlling the, the heat, uh, the air conditioning in my unit. I also need, obviously, the, the controls on the pieces, and I probably need that to be hooked in with my cell phone so I can do it from a distance. Right, I need an infrastructure that intercommunicates. So think about the customer. You've got a product for them. You say, this is a new and improved product. It's going to save you energy and or it's going to reduce the carbon footprint. Hopefully, it's going to do both of those. Uh, and so you should buy this product. And if you do a careful life cycle calculation, which you probably won't do, uh, you may find that this product is attractive. You still have to think about, am I going to use it? What do I have to do differently? Uh, and am I going to have to change out a bunch of other stuff? Because the critical point about energy, and you've seen this over and over again, is this is the installed base industry to kill for, right? It's got huge installed base of complementary stuff. Uh, so your wiring, your appliances, everything in your house are all built in a particular way. To change that, that's a big job, kind of scary job. Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to go too deeply on the customer today because I didn't give you any readings on that, but I think that's the primary one. Yeah? So I, I think that's you may have examples. When you think of disruptive innovation, actually, in some ways, this might actually not be correct because disruptive innovation comes from the bottom. So the transistor radio is a classic example. So when we just from two young people had transistor radios, but the, the point was is transistor radios were some of the teenagers who take in their room, listen to radio stations, um, so they didn't have to sit around the living room with their parents put on the big, big tube radio. And the point is, is that it was not disruptive to the teenagers. As a matter of fact, they got privacy there. The quality of reception was pretty poor, and the quality of sound was pretty poor. But it was a very inexpensive technology. You know, the same way that that, that all of you adopted social media, right? It's a very simple method to a lot of people that are used to not doing that, right? It's much more disruptive. So in many ways, when you think of it, you know, you are projects that you're working on for your papers, for example. You can think of disruptive innovation as ways that you can kind of find a customer that is actually a very, it's in many ways, it's a very simple way, almost too simple, right. a way to get there. And, and, that's, and then it disrupts from the bottom. So it disrupts the marketplace, but it's not necessarily disruptive for the individuals that take it up. Well, in fact, the, the, if you like, the disruption may be desired by your customer. So disruptive sounds like this is negative. So all, all of the family had to sit around the single TV set or the single radio set, and the parents may have liked that or may not have liked that, depending upon their style. But uh, certainly there were, there were customers who wanted to get away from that, right, who wanted privacy, wanted to go to their own rooms. So you say, this is disruptive for the existing family habits. But, but the question is, is there a segment that finds this disruption attractive? I'm just trying to open up this concept of disruption at all of these different levels because we tend to think of it, is it disruptive to the incumbent firm? But that's only one of the many considerations uh, and should not be a negatively or positively loaded term. It's a descriptive term. Is it disruptive? Does it require certain types of changes? And very often, does it require changes in a complementary set of activities? And then what are those changes required? So not how do we make it, but what changes will be required so that it is adopted? And that will often be a more central part of the business model than how do we make it. That's. We did solar in particular. Point of view, and we'll come back to them we got there next. But putting a lot of wind in an electric power system requires a lot of changes in other parts of the system. I mean, it's not disruptive to people who get electricity. Uh, it's not disruptive to people who, you know, are buying. It's disruptive to how do you run the grid? Right. So, so if we push past, what, 6, 8 percent in a deep grid uh, in wind or solar, then it's disruptive to the grid. And it may be disruptive, it's probably going to be disruptive to the economic model of the grid because how do you recover the additional costs associated with having uh, the depth to deal with the intermittency, right? Or, or you could say wind has to have storage at source so that its interaction with the grid, it's, grid is smooth, right? That's happening in some places. Yeah. No, no, A123 is actually in Chile they've got this. So you've got wind farms way the hell away, right? If you've got a wind farm a long way away from a population center, then your problem is you're going to have to build a very high-capacity line. 
to deal with the intermittency. It becomes economic to put grid level storage at the wind farm, tuned to the wind farm, so that it can then feed through the line on a steady basis. And now it's not disruptive, but now it's disruptive in that wind farm has to combine storage, right? So it's a more complex business model to avoid the disruption uh, to the grid. So general point, any technology you think about, you need to think of the various points at which it may be disruptive. And not saying disruptive is bad, but rather to focus on who is going to have to change how and will they have the incentives to do so and how could you work on those incentives for them to do so. Right? It's, it's just a way of thinking about the process. Okay, uh, incumbent firm's capacity to change. This is the Christensen article. Could, would some of you, one of you like to tell me the, tell us all the Kodak story in terms of those uh, four quadrants? I, I just happened to pick up the FT yesterday and had this beautiful story ready for today's class, right? So we all know that Kodak lost it, right? It dominated the, the film business. It was an early participant in digital technology. It certainly had the money to do it. It certainly had the technology to do it, and it's nowhere, right? So it totally lost the score, and it had a fantastic brand name. It had everything going for it, lost it. So what, what was it uh, in that story that, you know, I guess the question would be, Uh, does, this, does this framework even help, and how would we kind of shoehorn that case into this framework? Um, so did, did it fit with their proce processes capabilities, the one thing I'd add, processes capabilities and relationships? Did digital fit with Codex? Why not? How not? Uh, I mean, I guess for, for the longest time they invested in, well, film technologies, and so... Right. We're chemists. The pe one, you, start, you start off kind of at the habit or people level, right? The high prestige people in this firm are uh, optics people and chemists. There's some really ex pretty, pretty hairy stuff going on there. And those are, so first of all, the prestigious people, this is not prestigious, so that's a little bit of an issue. And so it doesn't draw on the chemical capabilities at all or the filmmaking capabilities. Kodak was also a very advanced manufacturing company. If you go on the Kodak plant, it was what, a mile long? A continuous, one single continuous machine to make all this film, just a technical marvel. Uh, again, digital cameras have nothing like that. So there's not a deep manufacturing capability. Right. Selling capabilities, putting them in stores ought to be about the same. Any, anything different about the model between putting cameras and film in stores versus digital cameras in stores? What? Well, film is a complement for a film camera. Film's a complement. You probably, you probably basically subsidize or sell the camera at a very low cost, especially the cheap cameras, right? There were disposable cameras that basically cost nothing because you're selling film. Uh, what's the complement that you sell with digital photography? So it's not really you may sell some compliments in the internet in terms of storage and in terms of social media, but it's not within your same category. It's not even people you know. Right, so I very quickly start saying, yeah, this would require Kodak to be a very different place. On the other hand, they do have a brand name that is associated with images, right? They do have the optics that are still very important in digital photography. So they have some relevant capabilities. They're not out of the game, but they don't have them all. How about the uh, values and time horizon? Did you pick up anything from the story about values and time horizon? Yeah? It didn't fit with their values because like, the way that Kodak had um, been like, started by the founder yeah. was um, just like with film, right? And it never talked about like, digital. I think that was the problem when they were deciding whether or not to go into digital. That's almost, a, that's identity, right? So. Is, is our identity images or is our identity photography? Yeah, and like, I felt that if they went into um, digital, they would lose like, a lot of their customers because like, they had always been like, built and that's it. You know? Or that they would cannibalize their customers. 
uh, thinking that they alone owned the transition. There's a little bit of hubris, right? Just because they were a leading firm didn't mean that they alone owned the transition. But let's, let's get down to the nitty gritty, value and time horizons. How, how did Kodak measure investments and the desirability of investments? What did they, what did, it was in the story, what did they judge investments on or businesses on? Good business versus bad business. It was there. If you, if you read the story carefully from a kind of financial or accounting perspective, it would have jumped out at you. Profit margin. The difference between sales price and cost. They were in a near monopolist position with a mature product. They had very high profit margins. Anything that they're looking at, they're judging in terms of profit margins. This new product, even if eventually it's going to have a high profit margin, will not have a high profit margin. You've got to be forward looking, right? The company is looking, let's say, quarter by quarter at the current profitability of the existing business. If you use that optic on businesses, which now fits the existing business, no way in hell you're going to choose this new business is going to take five, seven, eight years to launch. And it's actually going to take quite a long time to figure out what the complements are that you reach into to get the extra profit. Right? So if you, if you look in digital photography, I'm sure that a lot of money is being made by people other than camera makers. There's a lot of value out. There's a lot more photography being done. There's a lot more being swapped. Uh, granted, it's swapped at lower costs. But I sus it would be interesting to go out and add up who all makes money. Well, Facebook, right? <laughs> Facebook makes money, uh, YouTube makes money. You have a whole series of places that make money out of storing and swapping images. Some of that space might have been Kodak's, right? They were in the image business. They, they tried. They had an online well, they tried. Processing service. Point, point is, companies, companies evolve. Companies change with the conditions they are in, with the pressures they're in. This was a company with a very mature technology that it was driving. It had a couple of tough customer, uh, competitors, so it worried quite a bit about cost, but it still had nice margins. It had this fantastic scale and quality-oriented manufacturing. It had brand name-based distribution. It made most of its money off the film, not off the cameras. Well-tuned business model. And you could judge each different sector by profit margin. And along comes this new business that is going to take 10 years to build. Come on, guys, right? We're not in the VC business. We're in the current profitability business. Uh, so I think that puts a little life into this figure. It's hard. It's very hard for incumbent companies to change, especially, and we often talk about the disadvantages of a company being diversified because it gets very confusing, it's not focused, et cetera. One of the advantages may be that it may, in fact, house technologies at all three stages of maturity. Because if the company is predominantly at a mature stage, it's going to have a very hard time dealing with things at the transitional stage. Because everything it's going to do is going to be tuned to cranking it out, low cost, lean, right? manufacturing operations focus, the best parking lots will belong to the sales managers and the manufacturing managers, not the scientists and the innovation folks, not even the engineers. Right, so you're going to shift who gets the parking lot, who has the power. Okay. Husky was very finely tuned in a very in a different direction, not cost oriented, technology right. oriented, focused on a segment, all built to do to deliver top quality to a set of customers. Tough to turn that ship. Sure. It's very hard to be good without being finely tuned. And if you're finely tuned, it's very hard to change. That's the whole story. There's nothing more to it than that. Uh, then you can think about the different elements of that change. And I think this is a useful categorization to make an assessment of whether it's even worth trying. You can make an assessment, is it worth trying? And then what things would you have to work on in order to make the change? Or do you totally give up? Uh, Christensen's claim to fame, he basically says nothing innovative can come out of a big company. It always has to be a startup. Uh, that creates a major conundrum for us in the energy sector because almost anything you need to do in the energy sector is large scale and highly interdependent and therefore requires scale. But it needs a startup. Catch 22. <laughs> okay, any other questions about this? 
Uh, so I would assume that we're talking about organic growth, right? But a lot, of, a lot of times you'll see companies, especially in tech business, where you might not have that much uh, capital intensive investment. So a lot of things are really just based on software. For example, Google, I think they're very finely tuned, but at the same time, they're innovating very quickly. They're, they're changing things. They're, they, they acquire a lot of different types of companies. I think it's because they, if they see a technology that is promising, they are able to sort of grow inorganically by that company and see, you know, that let the company almost operate independently for a while and see how promising the technology is. Okay, so a very, very interesting point. So if we were to complicate it, we'd say that you could say that this is a story about organic growth, kind of just investing yourself. And you might say that we could avoid some of these issues by acquiring. Uh, and we can let things operate by themselves for a while, and then we can bring them in. Now we get a new set of challenges. The set of challenges is, is the company going to be successful at integrating the acquired firm? Or is it, is it going to leave it alone and basically become a portfolio owner, therefore it really didn't bring it in? Or is it going to bring it in and crush it? Uh, it's very hard for large companies to do this well. Um, one of my major case studies over the years has been Cemex, the Mexican cement company, and they have grown entirely by acquisition. Uh, and they are very, until 2007 when they bought the wrong company and almost bankrupted themselves, <laughs> they were very successful acquirers. But there were a lot of tricks associated with They have a post-merger integration process. One of the key tricks they developed, not a trick, it's very important, they developed the 80-20 principle in the post-merger integration. So after 18 months, the company we acquire, it's a cement company, is going to be operating exactly like the rest of Cemex. Hey guys, this is an acquisition, this is not a merger. You will operate exactly like Cemex. But if the post-merger integration team, which consists of people from Cemex and the newly bought company, don't come back with roughly 20% of the practices that they could change in Cemex, they failed. Right, so we're willing to learn from the company we acquire that's a way of creating dynamism in a large parent company. Right? Very few companies have that kind of dynamism. I've done a lot of work with BP. BP bought Standard of Ohio, BP bought Amico, BP bought Arco. They changed the label, they didn't change the systems, and you see what we got. So acquisition doesn't solve the problem. It may give you, it may give you a way to have multiple cultures. It may give you a way to have two pieces of the company that operate on a different clock speed. But if you're going to gain the advantage, ultimately, you're going to have to integrate it. And that's very, very, very hard. So good point, but. <laughs> One of the things that also happens from time to time is you typically made, at the startup, you've made the founders of that company rich. Yeah. And you know, I can stay and work in a larger organization, although I prefer a small company, or I can go buy a yacht. And, <laughs> and, or, and, it's, and it's my baby. Yeah. So, so if, you, if you bring in the acquisition side, and especially then you have to also deal with kind of family and founder life cycles, which is much more Hiram's area. And so you have to lay that in as well, right? So you've got to be at the right life cycle. Uh, but so the acquired firm has to be willing to be acquired and has to actually want to transfer what it's good at. And the key middle employees of that acquired firm want to stay, have to want to stay there. And the top management either wants to integrate itself into the company's bought or just vanish. Uh, so, so now we have this dynamic within the incumbent firm. We also have the dynamic within the firm we're going to acquire. So it may solve our problem, but it's difficult. So bottom line, change is hard. Change is particularly hard for large bureaucratic organizations. If a company has really dominated a product market segment in something like energy, by definition, it's huge. It's very bureaucratic. It's probably very cost-oriented. Uh, if it's a public utility, it's even worse because it's regulated. And again, it's very large. <laughs> uh, and it's focused on cost and a very particular definition of service. Uh, and it has a set of people and capabilities for delivering the current products and service, not for developing new ones. Right? So it's going to be the extreme of this case. Okay, let's go to the next level. So the system context change. This is the Michelin article, right? So Michelin brings you this new 
no flat tire. Uh, why, why did it fail in the marketplace? Was it a lousy design? Great design, right? Then why did it fail? Uh, yeah, Julian. Uh, the uh, repair shops didn't want to take the time to put in new expensive infrastructure to help change the tires properly. Uh, OK, so this is a tire. An automobile tire, unless it's absolutely perfect, and of course, why would you have a run-flat tire if it was perfect, right? The fact that it's a run-flat tire already admits to the fact that it's going to have damage and need repair. So the, the inherent nature of the product says, this is a product that you buy and then a product that you service. Uh, and the whole appeal is you want to be able to drive to the service shop, right? You want to go 45 miles on your flat tire at night. You don't have to stop on the freeway, et cetera. Uh, so it's embedded in a system. Is it just the tire repair shop that we need? Or do we need any, do we have any other complements that we need to make this work? Yeah? Does it need, it need new rims? Because it, it needs a rim. rim. It needs a clincher yeah. rim. If you ride really old motorcycles, right, you have clincher rims. Now we have rims that are just with tire pressure. This needs a clincher rim again, so you've got to go and talk to Hayes or whoever it is that makes the wheels, and you've got to get the auto manufacturer to specify those more expensive rims that have the clinchers on them. And then also the pressure management system that was integrated in the vehicle itself. So, so now I have to buy the valve stems, but it also has to be part of the, comp of the car's computer system in terms of the pressure management system. So who do I, let's just think about how many, how many parties we have to coordinate. And how many parties have to pre-invest before they know that this technology is going to work so they can work? So Michelin invests years in, in this technology. And they test lots of different kinds. And they find out this one works. And they're, they're a very good engineering company. Uh, they obviously, in that testing, had to work with some wheel manufacturers. But they've got to get some wheel manufacturers to pre-invest in that capacity. They've got to convince Honda or Toyota or General Motors or somebody to specify that tire and wheel, probably on a premium model, probably at much too low a scale to make money on, to get it out in the marketplace and get it tried. And now I'm going to tell you that 5,000 vehicles this year are going to have that wheel, and it has to be able to be serviced at, what, 50,000 points in the United States? Because I've got 45-mile range. So I've got to be able to get to a authorized Michelin repair shop within that range. Otherwise, that product doesn't do me any good. Now I'm really pissed off. But I paid extra money for a product that's going to solve this problem for me. And suddenly I find out it's worse than the standard product, which I could have gotten fixed at any old service station. All right, you got it? So we have a product. And this is fairly simple. So I only have three, four maybe five different complementers to deal with. <laughs> but this is not an uncommon kind of problem. If you think about video games, who develops a game for a console that doesn't sell? Who wants to buy a console for which there are no games? You gotta get the consoles out and the games developed. Uh, when they invented credit cards, you had to get the merchants to uh, put in the terminals to accept the cards. And you had to get the consumers to carry them, but if no consumers carry the card, what good is the terminal? And if no merchants accept the card, what good is carrying it? This chicken egg problem of finding complementers is not uncommon these and days. The chicken egg, and, and if you're if you're going to drive the development of this platform, which is what it is, it's now the Michelin Run Flat platform that includes the Michelin tire, the inner ring that is ma manufactured by someone else, the rim that is manufactured by someone else, the tire monitoring system that is manufactured by someone else, and the distributed repair stations, right? Uh, then you're probably going to have to have a brand and reputation that make people think that you will succeed. You have to have a deep enough pocket that convinces people that you will succeed. And you have to have a deep enough pocket to pre-fund some of these other activities, right? So this is not an activity for a startup. Startup might well come in on the platform. In fact, it may be the best time to come in because the platform sponsor has to pre-fund the compliments anyway. Startup may be available for cheap to come into one of those places. Right? So, but they can't push it. So this is just a perfect example of the compliments. What? 
Yeah. Right. So if you came up with this design, you'd say, who, who could make best use of this design? And the first question you're going to ask is not what technology is involved and who knows how to use this technology, but what changes will be required for this product to make it in the marketplace, and who has the standing and the power and the prestige to bring about those changes, right? So you're looking at your technology, but you say, what, is, what needs to happen? For, if you're making an app for an iPhone, that problem's been solved for you, right? Apple has created the platform. They even have the cash collection system for you. They even have their standards. All you have to do is make your app and stick it on the platform, because the platform exists. And in fact, a good platform is a good entry point for smaller firms. But if you've got an idea that is going to change a system, you're going to have to find a system driver. OK. Uh, any ideas about what Michelin might have done with uh, all of those tire people? Yeah? Well, I was just thinking, as you were talking about, wouldn't it maybe have been better since they have, they have this, they need a network of places that can repair the tire to maybe approach the market from like maybe a really like luxury sports car type manufacturers? Because they kind of, like if you're going to buy a really expensive car, usually you only trust a couple of people to service that car. Then you only need that tire repair system in that special service shop. And people who own those expensive cars are willing to pay more and like take their car to the special service shop. Key lessons. You pick a segment. You pick a seg you pick a segment that will place a very, very high willingness to pay for your innovation. Remember last session? You pick a segment that is manageable. And in fact, initially you're probably going to pick a segment that is not profitable. Because your goal is to get out and show that it works. And if you go for the big segment, then you've taken on a big change problem. If you go for the small segment, you've taken on a manageable problem. Now, I've got this set of specialized tire repair places. And I probably already have agreements with them that they, were fa they will favor Michelin, right? What I do, I rent them the machines. And I charge them on a per-use basis. Because I say, I don't know if you're going to have any customers for this machine or not. That's my risk. Your risk is learning how to use it, right? And if we succeed in selling this thing, then you're going to get some business, and then you can pay me back piecemeal. So you could think about business models that took the complementers into account. My sense is Michelin did not do that because they had a better product. They had a clearly superior technology. There was no question this was better. But to get people to adopt it, change, 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 and I have to think about it differently as the customer a little bit, but it's mainly my complementers that I have to bring along. And I have to get it specified on the car, and then I have to service it afterwards. OK. Um, difficulty of change, and this, I guess you've had, you've had Dick channeling Susan as opposed to Susan teaching you <laughs> on the kind of the cultural, the cultural sociological side. But this is a little bit like culture. Uh, if you think of how hard is the change on the customer's part or on the firm's part, I would argue that it goes in this order. So I've got to learn how to do new things in a different way. That's pretty hard. But it's harder right, if I have to use new complements or change the form in which I use things. So use form, uh, shared cars versus owned cars. That's a totally different use form. It's a very different style, right? or clustered housing versus distributed housing. Whole series are like that. And then finally, right, different way of thinking about it. Uh, we, we, collectively in this country, a car is immediately available so we can go someplace on a whim. And that's one of the advantages of having a car, is that freedom, right, being untied from schedules or being untied from this and that and the other thing. If we were to go to shared cars or public transportation or something else, we would have to change the rhythms. Right? Because suddenly you have to become synchronized with everyone else again. You have to become Swiss. <laughs> right? Swiss society is built on railroads. American society is built on cars. Well, that's, that's deep. That's really deep for a society that has not developed that way and where people really value that autonomy. So just think of kind of levels of change. OK. Uh, discontinuity will happen at the level of industry as well as technology, and there'll be an era of substitution, era of design competition, area of incremental change. This is, again, in the Munir and Phillips article. 
industry dynamics. This is kind of a repetition, dominant design, similar competencies. Uh, the interesting point in, in this article, they talk about the activity network versus the industry because you think of there is a field of firms that are both competitors and complementers. And in a well-established industry, there will be four or five other firms that look like you, and that will be the industry, and that's pretty much who you look at. In a transitional phase, there are all kinds of players that might be involved, and you've got to think outside your normal boundaries. That's their key point. I want to get you to the next, next slide. This is where I want to end. So this is a way of bringing together technology maturity versus the product architecture. Uh, Roger Miller is a friend of mine. I did a book with him about 10 years ago. This is his latest book. It's about to come out. And he says, think, think of innovation as a game. Every innovation is a game. It has many, many different players. And product architecture is the product standalone, is the product platform based, is the product a closed system. Market maturity, is it emerging? Is it in the transitional phase or is it mature? Right. Eureka. What does that say? Single inventor, startup, neat idea, eureka. It's standalone, it's transitional, you do it, right? Mature markets, standalone, new and improved tide, <laughs> right? It's the new version or five star, five star energy rating as opposed to energy star rating as opposed to four star energy star rating or uh, the next version of LEDs, a little more warmth, warmth than the light compared to the last warmth. That, right, the lighting pattern is already satisfied. We're now in incremental improvement. Is it platform-based? Uh, so Apple, iPhone versus uh, the other guys, right, Microsoft and whatever they sell, uh, Android. Uh, so Apple versus uh, iPhone versus Android. That's, those are platform wars. And you've got heavy, heavy investment by sponsors of those platforms fighting with each other. And you have a lot of app producers who are actually playing across both of them, right? And they're both in both ecosystems. Uh, or if it's mature, it's mass customization, it's just apps. It's no longer the platform wars because there is the established platform. System breakthrough pushing the envelope. I'm not quite so sure about his terms there, but interesting classification. So. Uh, let me change this question. Let me change the question to think, think about the technology that you are working on in your team and decide where it fits there. Take, take a couple of minutes to think about, uh, kind of position it, tell us why. Because it'll tell you a lot about uh, the business model that's going to go along with your technology. Let me be countercultural in Cambridge, so let me start on my right. <laughs> And just go around this way. I don't have to get everybody, but you know, each team kind of tell me, tell me what your technology is and where you think it fits. Oh, okay. So why is it platform based? Okay, so, so there's, we're, we're, we're in a, certainly a transitional technology area. I would think the platform base becomes, again, uh, who bears the cost of storage and where does the storage fit into the system, right? So it's, it's going to become part of a grid. But it's also who are the complementers that make the pieces. Uh, you may have battery makers on one hand and semiconductor people or the folks doing the thermal, uh, who makes the big block of graphite or whatever you do with the right. thermal storage medium. So you, you do have different sets of complementers depending on what roads you go down. But I think. Is that what you have in mind? Yeah. yeah. And so there's going to be some, there's some pathway of grid development with particular types of storage embedded in order to make this storage feasible. And that, that, in that sense, would be a platform, and that's good. Okay, next, next group. Yep. Uh, we, sorry, we were talking about solar also, um, but uh, like while the technology is always uh, getting better, and the need for solar, solar is always going to be increasing as well. Um, what's like more important in our eyes is pressing it on, on like the market that's already mature versus something that 
does it for once all day. So where does that put you? Where? Like it's not that, not necessarily that you're, uh, you've improved like one solar to another, but you're improving a, uh, an, uh, like at, get just at acquiring. Grid really? level or household or? Uh, more household. Sure. More household, that would be very different, right? So uh, it may be radical for the household, but it's kind of one more feature to change your energy cost mix and change your greenness. So in that sense, it might be new and improved. It probably has a brand name beside it. It probably has a financing complementer. It may have, you know, it be, be Sears Home Improvement, where you put it on charge and you do 17 other things at the same time. So it could be, it might be here or it might be here. It could be between those two, depending upon the economies of scope. But that's good. Okay, next, next team. Uh, we're talking about doing combined Okay, so, and again, and again, the question is whether you need to link those or whether the grid will link those, right? right. And, and Dick and I were just talking about what's the difference between a closed system and a, and a platform-based system. If the grid manages the complementarities, then it's an open system. If you manage the complementarities, you've chosen to mix them. Okay. Uh, I'm going to run out of time quickly, so let me do a couple more teams, that team and this team here, and then we'll come down to one team over here to more or less cover. So what do you have? Nuclear, nuclear. nuclear again. So, okay, anybody who's different, anybody who's down at the, at the user end of the chain, yes. Um, well, I, mean, I want to say, yeah, I guess using in terms of transportation. So, yeah. Yeah, so ours is about uh, publicly shared electric vehicle systems. Okay. Uh, so. Our guess would that that would kind of tend towards a platform war oh, yeah. because, uh, well, like it's it's and even though the actual market before the transportation market is kind of mature, but the the incoming technology is very much in a transitional phase. Like you have to improve a lot of the, you have to improve the technology to make it feasible. You need to kind of change uh, existing infrastructure in the system, like charging and other things. And you also have to change some fundamental habits in many ways. So you're talking about a large system change. You're going to need a, an important systemic change agent. Okay, you could go on on this. I think it's very important to kind of classify where you are. Uh, if you think of what are the different business models, just quickly in the last minute, Startup or Skunk Works, right? So either it's a freestanding company or it's a freestanding piece of a company because it really is autonomous and you want to optimize the innovation process. That's probably an established brand. New and improved because it already has some reputation, it already has market position, it already has distribution. The product is not different enough to get you out of that channel. If it's up here, you know, you need a networked shaper, somebody who's got money and name and whatever else. Down here, you, this is already somebody who has a dominant platform. Who, so the utility has a dominant platform if it will bring you in. If not, how do you go around it? This is probably a public-private consortium. Right, your nuclear solar, you're going to get this developed by a public-private consortium the first time around. It's too big. It's too complex. No one's going to take it on other than that. On the other hand, if we're talking about a, a new generation of, uh, of generation, a new kind of grid generation, probably maybe a large incumbent, so Duke Power or Southeast, one of the big utilities in the South, or a private consortium. This is not final, but this gives you an indication of... Who do you have to be when you grow up? Not because of the complexity of the technology, but because of who needs to change in what ways in order for your technology to be implemented. So that's, that's the story on innovation and business models. All set, thanks.